uh, good morning dear students so again we we are still in this uh, chapter of shoulder joint in the biomechanics and uh, today we have last class we have discussed about the supraspinatus impingement so this class will start with the glenohumeral motions so just to make it familiarize familiarize again we just so i just wanted to show you the structures the shoulder joint which you are talking about this scapula we can see the all the process here the acromion process of the scapula the clavicle the the uh, distal end of the clavicle and then the acromion that's which forms the acromion clavicular joint here you can see the glenohumeral joint which is this joint and then you can see the glenoid fossa and then the, you can see the head of the humerus which is this is an anterior view of the right shoulder joint and here you can see the posterior view here you can, the only difference is you can easily make it out because you can see the spine of the scapula on the posterior view and you can see the the slope of the acromion process of the scapula now in when you are talking about glenohumeral joint and uh, to especially talking about the glenohumeral motions the motions can be usually be uh, described as having three rotational degree of freedom of motion so glenohumeral motions are three degrees of motion that means it happens in three axes and the first is uh, the fle flexion and extension as you can see in this picture and then abduction and adduction and then medial rotation and lateral rotation what you see as a circumdation is the, the extra accessory movement but which is actually a combination of all these the two movements that is abduction uh, adduction and flexion extension together forms the circumduction so when we elaborate into that the flexion extension occurs in the coronal axis passing through the center of the humeral head the glenohumeral joint is often considered to have 120 degree of flexion and about 50 degree of extension that means that the flexion extension uh, of the glenohumeral joint happens in a coronal axis that means that it's in a, it happens in a sagittal plane so then the axis should pass through the center of the humeral head as well as the center of the uh, uh, glenoid fossa and the glenohumeral joint is often considered the range of motion flexion extension flexion is a maximum degree of 120 degree and about extension of about 50 degree of extension in the glenohumeral joint the second uh, movement the degree of movement is uh, abduction adduction the abduction adduction of the glenohumeral joint can occur will occur around anterior posterior axis passing through the humeral head center in a uh, for, in a which will happen in a frontal plane the range of motions for abduction of the glenohumeral joint if the impact of greater tubercle is avoided if the if you are negating the uh, effect of the greater tubercle hitting the uh, uh, you know the glenoid fossa or other structures are reported to be from anywhere between so that we can say that if that is not there then uh, there is no restriction then we can get around 90 to 120 degrees of abduction that is what we can get, get. and then the third degree of motion that is uh, the movement in the glenohumeral joint is medial and lateral rotation as I have already shown you in the figure the medial and lateral rotation occurs about a long axis parallel to the shaft of the humerus and passing through the center of the humeral head it is uh, working in a long axis or otherwise what we call as the vertical axis and the movement will happen in the coronal plane or a transverse plane now the range of medial and lateral rotation of humerus varies with position here uh, this movement can happen in various positions uh, with respect to the position of humerus uh, the humeral the osteocanomatic position of humerus over the uh, scapula so the with the arm at the side that is a dependent position in normally uh, if you are doing the medial and lateral rotation may be limited very much less to uh, 60 degree of combined motion that is together both the <coughs> uh, the medial and lateral rotation combined would give you a 60 degree of combined motion abducting the humerus that means if you are abducting the humerus to a 90 degree frees the arc of rotation with the greenohumeral values of medial and lateral rotation increasing to up to 
120 degrees. So 90 degree of medial and lateral rotation of glenohumeral joint at when this, uh, the limb is in the side, uh, arms are in the side, and 120 degree up to 120 degrees of uh, medial and lateral rotation, lateral rotation possible when the humerus is subducted to 90 degrees of uh, range of motion. The restricted arc or what we call as the when we abduct this movement actually is a rotational uh, movement and this can be similar to an arc of so the, the here we are talking about the arc of the medial rotation when the arm is at the side may be related to different alignment why there is a difference in the range of motion is only because when the arm is on the dependent position the greater and lesser tubercle when we are internally rotating there is a possibility of the lesser and greater tubercle coming into uh, contact with the uh, osteo uh, mean bony surfaces of glenoid fossa and other uh, structures so this can create a mechanical block whereas when you when the person abducts the arm to 90 degree this uh, restriction is negative now we will discuss about the intra-article contribution to glenohumeral motions. Full range of motion of the glenohumeral joint is to a reasonable degree a function of the intra-articular movement of the incongruent articular surface. We all know that this is not a uh, highly congruent joint because the uh, the size of the head of the humerus and the small shallow si uh, shaped uh, small area shaped uh, glenoid fossa it's not a congruent joint so the convex humeral head is substantially larger surface and may have to different uh, different radius of curvature than that is it has a different radius of curvature due to this incongruence what will happen naturally whenever there is incongruence there instability can happen so here due to this incongruence uh, rotations of the joint around its three axes do not occur as pure spins it's not only spinning but because of this uh, incongruence have to uh, they have to change the center of rotation and shifting contact patterns within the joint so here the intra articular contribution here to you have to understand that here during the rotation not only spinning you will also get some kind of you know uh, the change in the center of axis of rotation however elevation of the humerus requires that the articular surface of the humeral head slide inferiorly that means downward or otherwise called as caudally whenever the, when there is an elevation of the distal end of the humerus uh, over the uh, scapula the humeral head has to slide inferiorly that is opposite direction of the osteocanal the arthrokinematic movement will be inferior sliding with respect to the osteocanematic abduction of the distal head of the humerus in a direction that is opposite to the movement of the shaft of the humerus failure of the humeral articular surface to slide downwardly in abduction of the humerus would cause what can it, it usually should cause a superior otherwise upward or a cephalad rolling of the humerus head surface on the fossa naturally if if it has to slide for if it's not sliding downward what should happen it should move roll over the glenoid fossa and then it should run over the glenoid fossa and move cephaladly or superiorly or upwardly the large humeral head would soon run out of the glenoid surface and the head of the humerus would impinge upon the overhanging coracoacromial arch as we have discussed in the last class in the supraspinatus impingements uh, pathologies. So here is the, the, the figure to show you see normally the humerus in a dependent position and you have the glenoid fossa here and then you you can see the shaft of the humerus uh, dependent i mean downward uh, toward, uh, towards uh, gravity and when there is no there is uh, you know abduction and the humerus is go, going for abduction elevation so there is a possibility that the the roll the head can roll over and go and hit the acromion so this should be avoided how will it be avoided so the inferior sliding of the humeral head's articular surface is necessary to minimize upward rolling of the humeral head the inferior sliding of the humeral head's articular surface that means the inferior word sliding of humerus is very very important to avoid any kind of upward rolling of humeral head however it happens that humeral head as a whole or its center of rotation still moves somewhat superior mild superior translation is unavoidable so it on the glenoid fossa in spite of the downward sliding 
the humeral head center is believed to move slightly superior to 1 to 2 mm that even though we the, we have we need a cephalad you know downward uh, you know sliding but still there is an uh, upward translation of 1 to 2 mm until about 60 degree of active elevation of motion then the rotator cuff forces helps to stabilize and center the humeral head on the linear fossa. Now the, hum the rotator cuff will uh, help to stabilize and center the humeral head on the linear fossa. And now you can see the position. Now you can see, you have to see that this center of axis is for when the joint is in the, this black mark, the, the sketching of the humerus. And when it goes for, you know, you know, abduction, that is a abduction position is written shown with a red, a red dots now you can see that the axis of the second position which is abduction normally it is moved the center of axis of moved at least one to two millimeter upwardly towards the the cephalad the role of glenohumeral joint now we are discussing about the role of glenohumeral synovial joint capsule in stabilizing you know stat what is doing what is the role the glenohumeral capsule and its associated glenohumeral ligaments provide stability to the glenohumeral joint by limiting anterior, inferior or posterior humeral head translation of the glenoid fossa. So I repeat again, the, glen the role of glenohumeral joint capsule or this glenohumeral joint synovial capsule, the glenohumeral joint capsule and its associated glenohumeral we already know the glenohumeral you know, the superior middle and the inferior glenohumeral ligaments provide stability to the glenohumeral joint by limiting anterior inferior or posterior humeral head translation on the glenoid fossa so this the glenoid uh, capsule along with the glenohumeral uh, ligaments provides stability to the joint by not allowing any kind of translation in which directions anterior direction inferior direction and anterior and posterior direction and inferior that means superior direction movement is allowed freely a bit a uh, uh, movement is allowed but the glenohumeral capsule has a major role it will not allow any kind of a strong and healthy glenohumeral capsule will not allow any kind of anterior posterior or inferior translation of the humeral head on the glenoid fossa. The stabilizing functions of these structures is minimal at less than 90 degrees of humeral motion. When only the superior segment of the capsule is under any significant tension. So you have to understand that it's the stabilizing function is minimal less than 90 degrees of humeral whenever uh, the movement is less than 90 degree of humeral motion the glenoid uh, humeral capsule does not have, have any role to play that means some kind of movement should start then only the glenoid humeral uh, capsule can act as a you know uh, you know resistance as such kind of for all the above uh, mentioned translation the blending of the rotator cuff tendons into the capsule and ligaments results in some ability to ability to actively influence tension of the capsule and ligaments through the muscle contraction so you are you already know that we have uh, when we differentiate muscles we have muscles which are intracapsular and extracapsular and we already know that, know that the rotator cuff, cuff tendons are mostly intracapsular or intracapsular and that's why there is a blending there is a combination or blending or merging or mix uh, you know combination of the uh, blending of uh, merging of the rotator cuff tendons that is sits tendons along with the the synovial caps joint capsule of the glenohumeral joint and also all the other ligaments which are present and then this will influence the tension of the uh, you know for the influence of tension means that it will create some kind of a resistance to the uh, any kind of unwanted or undesired uh, movements that is what uh, is the role of glenohumeral joint capsule uh, in the glenohumeral joint motions okay